I'll say it in English now. Great Spirit, we thank you for another day, for all our blessings, our family, friends, relatives. We ask you to bless our leadership in our country and in our communities. Bless those that are sick. Bless those that are grieving. Give them hope and strength. We ask, we ask our ancestral spirits and you, Gistamandu, to help and guide us to carry out this work that we have taken upon ourselves, not to be ashamed to voice our concerns and thoughts. This we ask of you today, Great Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Flora. And thank you all for being here with us today. My name is Monica Shore and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. And I join you from the traditional territory of the Wasanich people on the southern tip of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. Welcome to you from wherever you're joining us and thank you for making the time. Um, a little bit about myself, I am first and foremost a mother with another child on the way in the next couple of days or weeks. <laughs> Hopefully I'll last the next couple of hours. Um, I'm also the co-founder and executive director of the Isako Lum Foundation, um, which is one of three host partners of the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, also referred to as the CRP. Um, the other host partners are the University of Guelph and the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. Uh, the Isak Olam Foundation's core purpose is to empower and support the establishment of Indigenous protected and conserved areas. As you all know, the, those four words are a mouthful and take a couple of seconds to say, so you'll also hear people refer to that as IPCA, and that, that means Indigenous protected and conserved area. Um, our friend and team member Zoe, Zoe Mager is going to be including some notes in the chat when certainly when some acronyms are shared so that people are aware of what we're talking about and as well uh, links to different initiatives that are mentioned. So thank you Zoe for your support in that today. And so on behalf of the Isak Olam Foundation and the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, we're pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar in which you'll be hearing from four different IPCA initiatives across the country. And while four people were sort of promoted within our uh, communications, some of the initiatives uh, will be will include a presentation with a, a group of people and I'll tell you about them as we get to that. And we had an incredible amount of people register for today's webinar. Um, so we're, we're aware that there's great interest in hearing from people who are at the beginning of their journey with IPCAs. And we, we in part designed today's webinar to hopefully inspire those who are also at the beginning of their journeys or thinking about what impact an IPCA or Indigenous Protected and Conserved Area could have on their territory and vision, um, inspire them to, to not be shy to be where they are in their process. Um, we're all at the beginning stages of these important initiatives and um, the, those who are there with us today are, I, I thank you for your courage and for your, um, for your willingness to, to just speak about where things are at. Um, so before we move to our panelists, which you're here, whom you're here to really see, um, just a few brief notes about this webinar series. Um, many of you have attended past webinars of what's called the Virtual Campfire Series. And the Virtual Campfire Series, which, is, which kind of hosts and holds this webinar today, um, was started by the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership in a way to keep dialogues happening during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think, you know, when we do come out of this difficult time, um, and yeah, my thoughts to you and your communities and families, I hope you're all well, um, is that 
these these virtual spaces continue to bring us together um, without the same kind of carbon footprint that uh, you know an in-person conference would. <clears throat> that being said, um, you know it can never fully replace the in-person relationships that we have with one another. With one another, so finding the balance is important. Um, so we will be putting a few links to uh, where you can find out more about upcoming webinars with the virtual campfire series. And you can also find recordings of past webinars um, on the CRP YouTube channel, which is now in the uh, in the chat link. And the next webinar um, after this week is a week from today, and it's called Celebrating 20 Years of Coastal First Nations, History, Governance, and Lessons Learned. So the series really takes on different angles of Indigenous protected and conserved areas. And I'm trying to think about, respond to questions that come in from people who are interested in the partnership and in IPCAs in general, and, um, and provide different perspectives on, uh, on those questions and different answers. So just some tech reminders, um, which are that the webinar is being recorded. Um, so if you do not want to appear in the recording, please turn off your camera. And it's, it's good that I noticed that my paper went from page two to page five. So then I, I know that I'm in the wrong place. The other piece is please mute your mic when you're not speaking. Um, and if you experience connection issues, um, sometimes it's hard with bandwidth. There are a lot of people on the, on the call. Um, you can try turning off your camera, that often helps. Um, about the flow of today's webinar, we have about 15 minutes per panelist or per IPCA initiative. Um, there'll be a moderated question and answer period and discussion following the panel. So. Um, please record your questions in the chat um, as they come up. We have a team um, here that will sort of help organize them and make sure that we're, when we get to that point of, of um, part, sort of audience participation, that we can ensure that we're getting to a different sort of different types of questions and that everybody's having a, a chance to respond. So thank you for bearing with me. Without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to begin the panel dialogue. We're going to begin today with um, the Akizibi IPCA in Algonquin Territory. And uh, we have three people who will be presenting on this. Justin Roy, Verna McGregor, did I get that? Yes, good. And Roseanne Van Shee. So we'll be, um, if you go into speaker view on your computers, uh, you'll be able to see sort of a spotlight on the on the panelists and it might reduce some of the screen fatigue that we get from gallery view so without further ado over to you and thank you so much panelists and team looking forward to hearing about your ipca <laughs> hello so do you want me to begin hello everybody uh, hello everybody, my name is Verna McGregor and I'm from Kittagon CP Anishinaabek. Uh, and I'm here today with Justin and Roseanne and they're going to talk about all the wonderful work that they've done with the Aki CB. I met them in uh, this past fall uh, and visited a site on the Ottawa River and have kept really been working with them because the site we went to visit is such an important site to the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg but the river itself is also important because for us as Algonquin, we, when I say Wagosh, I'd say, Fox is my clan on my mother's side. Nimki uh, Panesi is Thunderbird on my father's side. Why we would do that is coming into the territory. That would be your official introduction because our clan system was based on the watershed. So, and I do a lot of openings, for example, in Ottawa, and I say the significance of Ottawa is that you have the confluence of the four rivers coming together from the four directions, like the medicine wheel. And for us, we were known for the birch bark canoe. So, uh, when I heard about this Indigenous Protective Conservation Area, the Akisibi, I was thinking, wow, what a great uh, initiative. So that's why I'm on board. 
And that's why I'm introducing you to, to today to my uh, co-presenters, which will be Justin and Roseanne. So on that note, I won't talk very long. I'll hand it over to Justin to get the ball rolling. And I say, miigwech, kakina. Miigwech, Verna. Koe, hello. Uh, bonjour, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for all, everyone attending the, uh, today's presentation. Wonderful to see uh, the exactly 100 participants uh, on the Zoom call right now to take this in. Just goes to show the, uh, the interest in IPCAs across Canada. Um, I guess before talking about a bit about Aki CD and putting some context to what we're trying to do, uh, I know an IPCA is probably it's something that's fairly new to Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples uh, across Canada and has really, again, gained some momentum and, and steam the last couple of years and the work that's been done, especially out West. But uh, although an IPCA is new to, uh, to most, uh, I think we could all agree on the line that, you know, uh, the, the values or the meaning behind an IPCA is something that, that our peoples, Indigenous peoples have had for time immemorial. You know, the protection and conservation uh, of, again, all lands, waters, animals, birds, uh, everything associated with, with Turtle Island. So uh, it's great, again, to see everyone on the online here to take, in, take part and listen into some of the work being done by not just uh, us here in, on Algonquin territory, but the other speakers for today. So, again, uh, Chima Gwich for everyone for taking part in this. And uh, Aki Sibi, it was an initiative that was started uh, a few years back by the Algonquin Nation. Aki Sibi is a partnership and alliance between not just Quebec First Nation, but six other uh, Algonquin communities, those ones being uh, Barrier Lake, Winaway First Nation, Kitsisachik, Wolf Lake, Kitigan Zibi, and Timisamang First Nation. Uh, but Kedwick has taken the, the lead in trying to work towards the official implementation of ACTC because uh, it has not yet been implemented. But again, we'll talk a bit to where we are at and next steps and where we're trying to go. Uh, so with Kedwick taking the lead, we made an application uh, in 2019 to the Canada Nature Fund to its challenge component to uh, try and acquire funding so that the seven communities involved in ACTC uh, could have the, the funding necessary to, again, start putting the pen to paper and meeting and discussing exactly what is ACCB for all those uh, involved. So uh, with that application, unfortunately, we weren't accepted uh, to the challenge fund. I understand that there is a lot of desire and interest for this funding component, but due to the strength of our application, we were given a lot of kind of positive feedback and some leads on possible other funding sources that are out there. So uh, over the last year and a half, we've been, again, jumping from funding program or ministry or group organization, trying to do our best to acquire the funding needed to turn ACCB from a, an application on paper into a, a living, breathing uh, institute. Uh, so we've made great, great strides. Uh, again, ACCB is, is a translation from Algonquin that means land and water. Uh, if we're successful in implementing ACTCB, I believe it would uh, encompass almost eight or 900,000 hectares of land, which would be, again, a combination of different cultural or sensitive or historical sites from each of the seven communities involved. So it just wouldn't be one huge uh, plot of land. It would kind of be broken down into different areas, sites, territories, lands, and waters uh, uh, across the Algonquin uh, nation territory. Um, so again, with us not being successful in application, we've been following leads. Uh, a key part of Akisibi and a key, I guess, uh, land that we'd like to be protected is, a, uh, is an island called Fitzpatrick Island. Uh, we've been approached by the current private owners of this island to be to have the land given back to its uh, proper owners or stewards, that being the Algonquin people. So uh, we've been pushing in the direction of the Nature Conservancy of Canada, to which we've been working again very closely in trying to find the funds and resources necessary to be able to uh, acquire Fitzpatrick Island. Uh, in doing so, I believe if we're successful, if and when we're successful, uh, by us acquiring Fitzpatrick Island from a private uh, landowner, it would be the first of its kind in Quebec, and I believe Canada in being a private, uh, privately acquired land to turn into an IPCA. 
Um, again, with direction and help from NCC, Nature Conservancy of Canada, uh, we've been recently put in touch with the, uh, the Hewitt Foundation. Uh, they're a foundation that, again, gives charitable donations to, uh, I guess, numerous types of projects and groups uh, across Canada. And they have some values and interest in, again, working with Indigenous peoples and communities across Canada. Uh, and again, one of their values they hold is again, conservation, protection of land. So uh, we did make an application to their, to their foundation in the hopes of acquiring, again, funding that is needed to implement AccuCV. Uh, other funding that we've been pushed towards is from the Canadian Wildlife Service. So uh, the funding we're trying to get from the Hugh Foundation would be 50% of the costs to acquire the island, as well as additional funding to put towards the work at AccuCV with the remaining funding that, were, that is needed coming from the Canadian Wildlife Service. Uh, again, we've been told it's a priority project and whatnot, but again, with it being fiscal year and COVID and whatnot, we're just waiting for some uh, budget funding announcements to be made and Hopefully in the coming weeks, maybe months, uh, we're, we're both successful in acquiring the, the funding that's needed. Um, I'll maybe kind of leave it uh, there for now. Uh, and Rosanna could pass it over to you and uh, maybe fill in some of the gaps, some of the things that I missed. And uh, I'd be happy to do the same thing for you, Rosanna, if, uh, if something's missed or there's a gap in what was said. So uh, we wish everyone for, for listening about AccuCV and uh, Look forward to speaking a little bit further and answering any questions anyone might have. Jimmy Gwich, Roseanne. Um, Amy Gwich, Justin, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roseanne Vanshi, and I just want to thank everyone for gathering here today online um, and just to be included in this opportunity to discuss this powerful new Indigenous conservation and guardianship movement that's on the rise in Canada. Um, just as background, I've worked in forest conservation and wildlife conservation most of my life. I got my start out on the west coast of Canada. I was a board member of the Western Canada Wilderness Committee and uh, during that time was really active in uh, preserving the Carmana Walbrand Forest and also establishing the Vancouver Island Backbone Trail, which is like a a high country mountaineering corridor now uh, on Vancouver Island. Uh, originally I'm from Northern Ontario and I, I got called back here um, for family reasons when my father passed and also got recruited um, to work on a project in Northern Quebec uh, that involved working with the Crees at the time when they were considering damming the Rupert River which, which did happen. And so um, during that time, they asked me to come in and evaluate conservation aspects and potential ecotourism opportunities. And after I finished that job, I kind of ventured down into Algonquin territory and was hired by um, an organization called ZEC Kippewa which are zone ecologiques control A in Quebec. So controlled ecological areas um, that are a result of the René Levesque government era, era where he wanted to open up uh, private conservation lands that were used exclusively for fishing and hunting, mostly by American groups to the general public, to the Quebec pu public. So I got hired by them to do an inventory of the canoe routes on Algonquin territory. So while I was out inventorying these canoe routes, um, the Algonquins themselves uh, were constantly bumping into myself and my family and saying, who are you and <laughs> where are you from and what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, to, that, to that point, I introduced myself and, and the work I've done over many years uh, in forest and wildlife conservation and Chief, the late Chief Harry St. Dennis invited me to the band office and he said, um, Roseanne, I, you know, I've heard you've been out on the territory. I'm kind of curious what you're doing out here. And I said, well, I'm doing an inventory of the canoe routes uh, here. And he explained to me that, you know, all the waterways 
on Algonquin territory were the ancient highways of the Algonquin peoples. And why was I working for Zek when I could come and work for them and do the same work and help them advance conservation efforts on their territory. So together we started up uh, the Algonquin Canoe Company. I worked as an economic development officer for a number of years um, for Wolf Lake, but really a big part of promoting uh, tourism and canoe routes was protecting the quality and quantity of the resource that, that surrounded it, which involves harmonizing forestry activities, right? And harmonizing industry activities and leading to more conservation. So we became very active in creating buffers around watersheds. And one of the key watersheds we became very involved in at the time when the Quebec government was trying to increase its protected areas, land base to 8% around 2008, was in the Maganacibi watershed. And in Algonquin that translates to Wolf River and since 2008, working very closely with Wolf Lake First Nation and Kaywick First Nation, um, we've established 200 square kilometers of protected area in that particular valley. And while we were in there working, we, we noticed another thing, and that was that the wolves were present they were, they were coming in as we would go into the conservation area and they'd scat and, and mark the territory. So when we came out, we could see that they had been there. And so that led to um, our identifying the need to kind of regroup with that particular population and, and find out why it was calling us and what that story was. So we approached the Mitsubishi Foundation of the Americas in New York, and they provided a, a social uh, environmental grant to get us started in uh, helping identify who this population of wolves were in, the, in that particular watershed. And working in partnership um, with myself as a researcher from University of Toronto, we discovered that in fact, that population of wolves in the Magnesibi River Valley is a threatened population of eastern wolves that are on the verge of extinction. So this particular project has grown from just like forestry harmonization all the way to establishing itself as an indigenous uh, protected conservation area. It doesn't have the official recognition from the government of Quebec. This is something we've lobbied for. Uh, there was a recent bill um, that was passed in the Quebec legislature, but unfortunately it doesn't uh, recognize indigenous protected conservation areas um, under the International Union for the Conservation of Nature standard. So, as we're affected by the state and its own regulations, um, it's important for First Nations to have this sense of self-determination to help implement the United Nations rights for Indigenous peoples and make declarations to their own Indigenous protected conservation areas based on their own values and interests and needs in protecting these areas. So that's something uh, we've been doing as part of the Aki CB project is coordinating with all seven communities to see what their interests are and how to advance them. Um, that, that's just one project I've mentioned out of many. Each community has its own uh, projects that they're trying to advance, including um, doing more uh, forest conservation through forestry operations. Um, you know, too long Indigenous groups have been denied full participation in the Canadian economy. And we're looking at like how these harmonization um, efforts by individual communities can lead to their own ecosystem benefits and financial mechanisms. Um, so the, the, the current situation um, that Justin described was Right now we need the time, the capacity and the resources to consult with each of the communities to see how they wanna move forward. 
and the Canadian Wildlife Service um, is looking towards offering us some funds to regroup with all seven communities to set up the Aki CB Institute. So um, the Institute itself um, will be a working group of each of those communities where together they'll apply thousands of years of sustainable principles and values and revisiting these systems that Verna had mentioned earlier, like the clan system, what did that mean exactly? Um, you know, how the Algonquins played such an important governance role in the Ottawa River watershed. So um, I want to thank you all for uh, giving us the opportunity to speak about this today. We do have in the chat box a link to a project video uh, that we made in partnership with the Nature Conservancy this summer. So if you want to click on that, um, you'll, you'll find the communities themselves speaking to the subject and they have so many wonderful projects to share. So uh, I just wanted to make that available. And for more information, I've got your contact uh, email there, Justin. So miigwech. Miigwech to you, Verna, Justin, and Roseanne. Thank you so much for, for sharing some of your story. Um, and, you know, within the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to hear sort of the diversity of stories that, uh, that, that each IPCA has and that the origin is different for everyone, um, that it may start with a project, it may start with, uh, you know, the desire to protect species, it may start with um, the desire to envision, you know, the, the future of, of the economy of the area, uh, thinking about how we, you know, position or put, um, you know, nature first or whatever it is. So I'm hoping that today that one of the takeaways that people have is that there are different um, different approaches and different stories and they're all they're all valid and valuable. And one of the pieces, um, just to comment on um, something that Roseanne said was, uh, you know, know, about official recognition. That's the beauty of Indigenous protected and conserved areas or IPCAs. You don't have to wait for any official recognition. It's the, it's about, it's about nationhood and self-determination and, and the nation itself declaring and asserting its own laws um, through the IPCA initiative. <clears throat> and we have some really good um, recordings of past webinars that touch on this topic. And if you're interested, uh, please do reach out to myself or to Allison and we can get some, uh, some emails, uh, some email addresses to you. Um, the other piece is I, IUCN protected area category six is an interesting one where sort of ICCAs or the international uh, framework for indigenous protected and conserved areas um, fall under it. So, so that's an area maybe we can put a link to um, IUCN category six there for people to explore um, as there is sort of a, there is the beginnings of an international voice um, and advocacy for, for the work that you're all doing. And just a reminder, IPCA, what we mean by that is indigenous protected and conserved areas. So um, yes, thank you, uh, Verna, Justin and Roseanne. And we're gonna move on now to um, the Kitaskinan IPCA initiative in Northern Manitoba in Cree territory. And uh, we'll be joined by Elder Flora and her, and her colleague, Robin Constant. So over to you, Elder Flora and Robin um, to tell us about your IPCA initiative. Thank you. I think Monica, uh, we seem to have lost Flora. So I think we're just gonna switch. Okay, the sure, thank you. The ones. Um, so uh, switch over to Bisho Lake. Matt, would you, is that what you're suggesting, Zoe? Sorry. Uh, yes, for now. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Matt, would that be okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I will. I will um, introduce you now to Matt Munson. He's uh, with the Denetha First Nation, and uh, he'll be speaking about the Bisho Lake IPCA, um, which is in. Northern, Northern Alberta. I'm going to um, just share Matt's slides for you all and uh, bear, me, bear with me for one quick second. Here we are. Okay. Over to you, Matt. 
Great, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you today. Um, I, uh, it's, it's just an honor and a privilege to work with my community and all of the allies and partners that we've um, worked, uh, we've, we've managed to work well with and, and uh, along the way. So um, I do have some acknowledgements at, at the end of the slideshow. Uh, we definitely couldn't have done any of these things uh, uh, without many partners and, and allies. So I wanted to just acknowledge. So my name is, is Matthew Munson. I'm, my Dene name is Eve Claus Didzina. I'm a, a Dene Va Band member, and I'm also a technician for our lands department. And so uh, it's been really interesting to see um, some of the intersections between uh, Western scientific paradigms and, and Indigenous knowledge uh, coming together in, in uh, in this way. Um, so uh, I just wanted to acknowledge um, uh, uh, that this presentation uh, we've developed with one of our uh, partners, CPAWS, uh, Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society with Northern Alberta, and uh, uh, Fred Dezina, he's the lands director of Dene Da First Nation, uh, our chief, James Anise, um, and the executive director of CPAWS Northern Alberta, Keisha Kerr, um, all had contributed, of course, to the project, but also had um, also contributed to the slideshow. Um, so I'm going to move to the next slide, please. Okay, um, I understand that due to some limitations of technology, um, even though we've had a year into the uh, into the pandemic, uh, there's still not uh, ability to do video over the Zoom calls well. Um, but just like um, uh, the previous uh, IPCA and their uh, nation had mentioned they've done a, a film, uh, we have also done a film. And that film um, was done uh, with uh, River Voices and Environment and uh, Climate Change Canada uh, and some others that I'll talk about later. Um, but if you are more interested in, in uh, some more details of the project and um, seeing the video, uh, those are on the website and uh, this is the link to get there. Thanks, next slide. Okay, what is an IPCA? So of course, if you're at this, at this uh, conference, you probably already know or have, a, have some idea. Um, and so I'm not, I'm definitely not going to read off every slide, but this one is important because this is, this is, uh, you know, speaks to the heart of, of, um, you know, what our community has, um, when it terms, to, it, when it comes to, you know, what the values are, what, you know, why this area is important, um, how we can be part of, uh, ensuring that, that the area stays in, in good shape, um, for a really long time and that we are, active uh, on the landscape in ways that we have always been traditionally, but also have some agency and some official capacity to be involved in some of the decisions and some of the science and, and uh, knowledge um, uh, based activities that um, govern things like, you know, development and tourism and uh, conservation of habitats and species and so forth. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to read that. You've probably read that already when I was speaking. And this is definitely uh, um, something that uh, from the Indigenous Circle of Experts, the National Advisory uh, Panel, um, you know, this this really uh, was, um, to my to my knowledge, where this uh, IPCA, you know, really started to um, take take some shape and uh, and and be a, a tool that we can now. Um, uh, greater in have uh, recognized and implement in, in planning, consultation, um, and also uh, decision making, um, but also for our communities to um, be more involved in, in what happens uh, in areas that are really important to us and make sure that those are protected and conserved in an Indigenous led way. Next slide, please. Ooh, this is a lot of text. I'm not going to read that again. Um, but this is essentially, there's a few elements here. Um, uh, this is direct from uh, ICE as well. Indigenous led. So certainly the First Nation, uh, Dene Da, has, has uh, 
you know, always considered Bistro Lake area to be uh, a, a really important area. Um, we have for generations uh, behaved uh, in, a, in a way uh, consistent with protecting and conserving the area. Um, certainly uh, uh, have uh, modeled our, our livelihood pursuits actually uh, very, very uh, much um, based upon you know what what the carrying capacity is of of the area what what uh you know practices uh, uh that we can undertake to um remain consistent with um you know within the the levels of natural variation um and make sure that uh, that that area is uh, is really important Matt, I just lost your sound. I'm not sure if I'm, uh, I'm alone there. Oh, hello. There we go. Oh, uh, how long was I cut off for? For like five seconds. Five seconds. Okay. Okay. Um, so elevating Indigenous rights and responsibility. Um, certainly, uh, uh, you know, we, we are in Treaty 8 and we, we do have treaty rights across the, the, uh, the treaty area. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it seems more and more... Um, you know, First Nations, there's an assumption that uh, uh, the rights based activities, hunting, trapping and fishing, for example, are, you know, kind of infinitely adaptable elsewhere. And elsewhere basically means where a development or project is not. And so the assumption is, is that uh, uh, everywhere else is just as good as here and you have the rights to go anywhere else in the territory and, and uh, you can do your other, you, you can do those things elsewhere. Uh, but you know, we're finding more and more that that uh, is not uh, the case with, you know, uh, uh, incremental development over time, cumulative effects, um, interactions between uh, different industry uh, uh, developments and impacts, and also uh, how our community members uh, seem to be needing to go uh, further afield and um, that the areas that uh, they prefer to go to are increasingly uh, less suitable uh, or the, uh, the resources and values that are uh, necessary to support those rights-based activities are, are uh, becoming uh, lesser in, in quality and uh, reduced uh, quantities. So this is a place, this is basically, uh, you know, Deneva and um, others, uh, uh, you know, it's almost like getting, getting a little bit tired of, of getting pushed around. <laughs> Uh, being told to go somewhere else, you know, this is a way for the community to take a proactive, um, you know, less uh, re reactive, um, take a take a way to uh, uh, to to stand up for our our areas that are important and stand up for our rights and and uh, uh, be recognized in, in in a more official capacity. Next, please. <clears throat> Indigenous led, I already talked about that. Um, so these are actually all of the, the pictures in this presentation are, are uh, from the lake and from uh, the work we've been doing. Um, there's, and all of the maps and figures that you'll see, uh, those are all, all of us. We, um, you know, there's no stock footage in here. Um, so this is, uh, this is us talking about uh, um, doing some traditional use study mapping, uh, developing, uh, you know, where, uh, identifying where on the landscape um, are the historic wagon trails, dogs, dog team trails, um, some potential locations for uh, a heritage trail network, uh, heritage cabins. Uh, we'd like to, we've got two reserves on the lake shores and we'd like to put uh, uh, a cultural uh, and research center um, and a base of operations for our Indigenous Guardian program. Um, there and also to run some uh, community uh, programming that include um, social development, economic development, education, training, um, but also to to provide a place um, you know that's safe in nature, close to our traditions and our our, our values and language uh, for community members that uh, may be uh, struggling uh, with you know. Um, you know, with uh, with issues that they are that they have, and uh, that there's a a place for us to to go and to heal and to relearn and to reconnect. Next, please. Uh, long term commitments to con conservation. Uh, this this is uh, a bit of a looks like it. This is a bit of a challenge for us in this area. 
Um, we are looking at uh, uh, a regional planning process, a sub-regional planning process right now. Um, it, it still has yet to be, I think, uh, developed on, on how, if and how we may be able to achieve some longer term commitments. Um, there are, for example, there are two uh, big islands in, in the middle of the lake that are, are really important for caribou um, when they rear their calves. And, and this, these are really uh, uh, important areas to protect, for example. And then there's a few areas of, around the, the, the shores of the lake that uh, uh, are part of the caribou migratory uh, routes and also, um, you know, the, the First Nations and, and uh, ourselves have uh, a lot of historic uh, pre-contact pre and uh, very recent actually up until the, to the uh, 30s when the smallpox came through. Uh, did we only then uh, were we forced to abandon uh, the, the settlements and villages and were, were uh, relocated elsewhere um, you know, through the uh, through the Indian Act and the uh, res the creation of the uh, reservation system, and so um, you know, I could go on about that, but I know there's limited time. Next, please. Um, this we've already talked about in elevating Indigenous rights and responsibility. Uh, one takeaway is that I've learned from my elders uh, is is that it's 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 one thing to have rights, treaty rights. Um, but along with those rights come responsibilities. And so a lot of the feelings in our, uh, uh, our community is that we've been removed from being a part of, of those responsibilities. We have, no, we have no agency, we have no capacity to, to uphold our, our responsibilities to the, to the land in, uh, that supports our rights. And so this is a way for us to be uh, participatory, uh, it's, you know, uh, 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 hopefully in a way that's not a uh, transactional, for example, if there's development coming in, then we have a chat and, you know, we might do some uh, mitigation or avoidance and then it's done and we go our separate ways. This is a way to uh, just, you know, provide a continuous um, uh, representation of, of ourselves and, and the things that we value on the land for long term. Next, please. I know I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to really speed this up. Uh, IPCA is in a Canadian context. Um, this is uh, stuff that you can find from the report, the ICE report, and it's a very well done report, I must say. Um, there's a lot to it. And what I like about the report is that it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't uh, preconceive the recipe for IPCA. It's very much uh, 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 context and, and community and, and location uh, specific. So, you know, what works for one community in one jurisdiction uh, with their partners and allies might be different in elsewhere. But, uh, you know, it, it does it does really provide some really good guidance on, you know, what the spirit and intent of these are. And I, I, I think it's uh, really uh, uh, well done. And I hope this tool gets supplied uh, throughout Canada and, and the world, in fact. Next, please. Um, so this is our late Willie uh, late elder Willie Chambeau. Uh, you can see this is a, a map of the lake, a traditional use study map, and he's he's outlining, um, you know, from his personal experience and where his family uh, uh, uses the land and what's uh, important. And so these, uh, what he's marking up on the map actually uh, is informing into our uh, IPCA uh, descriptions and also has um, informed into some Western scientific programs such as uh, uh, caribou camera uh, uh, camera trap program uh, sponsored through EC. And uh, some of the locations specified, you can see number seven there on the big island. Uh, we put a, car a caribou camera there at, uh, upon his uh, in uh, instructions and sure enough, uh, we found. So we'll, we'll go to the next slide, please. You'll see those caribou in, in, in the next slide or so. IPCA boundary, we didn't, do, we didn't put down any area boundary. Um, just because, um, you know, once you, it seems once you put a, 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 a boundary, then, then you have to really defend the, the boundary and you have to be prepared to, um, you know, almost uh, create uh, restrictions within. And so I understand that it might be necessary from, for conservation, but we didn't want to begin the discussion of, here's our area, you guys can't do this stuff in here. And then you know have that kind of discussion. So 
what we did though was the 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 yellow is the Bistro um, subregional planning boundary, and um, there was uh, uh, some pretty good uh, support from regional um, stakeholders that uh, an IPCA could be something that we could explore um, as the planning process unfolds. Next, please. Um, we've got a lot of oral history and uh, traditional use in the area. These are some place names that we have, not certainly not all. Um, our chief, uh, James Anise and, and uh, our late uh, Baptiste Machuya, he was the lands, um, lands manager. Uh, previously, they worked with a, a lot of elders and, and some of their work uh, that I helped um, put together into maps and data is actually part of the Royal Alberta Museum um, exhibit uh, for First Nations. And you can go see some of the place names there if you ever get the chance. Next, please. Um, archaeology is a big part of our program. We work with some uh, Western science uh, uh, accredited uh, archaeologists. We've been successful in finding many sites around the lake. And, and uh, in fact, uh, Alberta Culture has um, designated uh, each of the quarter sections, which is a quarter mile uh, square around uh, overlapping the shores of the lake as requiring um, not a level one assessment, which is pretty much computer desktop work, but actually uh, boots on the ground, archaeological excavation, if, if ever there was to be some development at the lake. So we've been really successful there. Next, please. <clears throat> traditional use. This is from our traditional use study database. There's points, lines, and polygons. Uh, we have very many sites uh, uh, that, you know, hundreds and hundreds, 785 points, uh, 120 lines, and then a bunch of place names just on the map extent of this alone. Um, thank you. Next. <clears throat> there is a history here, um, you know, back in the 30s, uh, Indian Affairs uh, recognized that uh, our community members didn't have enough food and uh, they were proposing to uh, designate a hunting reserve just solely for the community. And that you can see uh, is a very large area and it actually covers most of the traditional territory that Deniva now currently uh, asserts to the crown and also uh, Bistro Lake is, is pretty near the heart of that. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, reserves, two reserves, and we have our cabins and, and on the lake, and we're actually uh, looking to upgrade and uh, fire smart our area there. And, and uh, uh, certainly that's gonna be uh, an area that we wanna uh, upgrade to have all season use and bring in some power and communications that could support research. Next, please. Caribou Range, this is in the Bistro Caribou Range. Um, I was talking about the camera trap on the island. This is actually from that camera trap. We, we collected the data this fall. And uh, <clears throat> interestingly, there's on the bottom slide, a collared animal. And this is, uh, we believe it's one of um, Alberta's collared females. And so we're working with the uh, uh, caribou people uh, from the province to um, to identify that animal within the telemetry, and hopefully we can uh, we can pull out that data and tell the story of where that animal has been and and where it is now, and hopefully it's still doing alive and well. We're actually going to be creating a storyboard for that uh, mapping uh, storybook, and we're going to uh, have that as one of the features on our website uh, probably in the next couple of months. Next, please. <clears throat> Um, there's other conservation values in the area, other species, other uh, uh, things, um, soil carbon, for example. Next, please. Um, industry, they're, they're, uh, you know, this is Alberta, oil and gas, forestry for sure. Uh, but the Bistro Lake area is largely uh, intact. There's some seismic up there. There's a few uh, random wells here and there. Um, but, and there's also a, a very large untenured forestry unit that uh, is, uh, it's, it's mostly too far from the mill to be economic and the, the, uh, the, the, the fiber supply is not uh, as good as it, as it could be elsewhere. So this is a really good place, kind of like it's when I was talking about elsewheres, uh, here's almost an elsewhere that doesn't, uh, that other uh, uh, users don't really uh, find too important uh, for those things. So maybe it could be uh, easier to prioritize it for some longer term conservation. Next, please. <clears throat> Here's some goals. These align very well with the goals um, that uh, are documented in the ICE report. 
Um, it is an interjurisdictional, uh, has some potential there because it does border BC and NWT. So, um, you know, there is some uh, interest for working uh, interjurisdictionally with other nations and stakeholders and governments to see if there's uh, a larger area that could be uh, used for conservation, um, you know, that, that uh, could be in that area. Next, please. Uh, here's a website link. Um, again, all of the website material is, is actually from the lake. None of it is stock. Next, please. <clears throat> this uh, picture is really amazing. This is uh, when we were up there in the fall, this, these northern lights were just, were just crazy. And this is a picture that uh, 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 one of our partners had, uh, he stayed up all night <laughs> actually uh, taking picture that, uh, of these. Um, so uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I just want to give a shout out to um, Chief James Anise, uh, Councillor Char Charlie Chambeau, uh, Elder Roy Salapri, Lance Director Fred Dizina, um, some of our partners at EC, uh, Wesley Johnson, uh, River Voices, Jeremy Williams, um, from uh, Alberta, Scott Dugid, Brian Makawecki, and from CPAS, uh, Keisha Kerr, Ryan Chang, Jillian Chow Frazier, uh, Eamon Reed and Short, and from uh, Tiega Archaeology Consulting, I've got Gregory Kvitchen, and there are many, many others. Thank you. Thank you so much, so much, Matt. It was uh, it was great to hear your presentation, and and I'm grateful to you for uh, for sharing some more sort of basic knowledge and background about Indigenous protected and conserved areas as um, there's so many who are uh, learning about them for the first time, um, you know, today and, and re of recent and who will continue to just hear it and need to have that, that background information. So you do us all a great, great service. Thank you. Um, we, uh, there was a question about whether you would be okay with uh, slide, the slideshow being shared with, um, with participants separate from Absolutely. the recording. Yes, of course. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, we had lost uh, Elder Flora for a moment. I think there was a power outage, but you're back. Welcome back, Elder Flora. And uh, um, Flora will be joined by her colleague, Robin Constant, um, to speak about the Kitaskinan IPCA in Northern Manitoba and Cree territory. So uh, over to you. Thank you. Well, you just have to unmute yourself, Flora. There we go. Okay, there we go. That's it. My name is uh, Flora Beardy, and I'm uh, I'm from York Landing, Manitoba. Our IPCA is called Kitaskinan Kawiganu Intigatig, and that's in Cree, and it translates into the land that we want to protect. And it is, uh, I don't know if we have the map of the project area that uh, we wanted to show, but it covers a lot of northern Manitoba down towards um, Bird or Gillam and then east towards the Hudson Bay along the coast of the Ontario border is the project area that we're looking at. We don't know if that's, if, we're, if the five First Nations will be uh, protecting the whole area. I would love to protect the whole area, but you know. Um, I am the uh, community coordinator and uh, there are five First Nations that, that will be working together on this. And of course, there's York Factory First Nation, Tataskwea Cree Nation, there's uh, Fox Lake Cree Nation, War Lake First Nation, and Shimadawa First Nation. And all of these communities, you know, share deep historical and ancestral ties in the region and, uh, in, and to one another. It was, this uh, project was started by York Factory and it was in response to um, a lot of different things that were happening in, in our region. There was like a, a maybe 60 plus years of hydroelectric developments, mineral potential and exploration, and then there are energy corridors that were under consideration. There's a wildlife management areas established without, without consulting the First Nations. And we are called the stewards of the land. And if we are not consulted, then that makes it 
that makes it really hard for us to look after our land. So there's a lot of other other things that brought this on. Um, the resource, our resource management board that was created wasn't active for over 20 years or so. So, you know, that's another issue that uh, we had to look at. We have, our land is beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful area and it has to be healthy to support our people and all, and all that creatures in it, the whole earth as a whole. And when these, when these uh, developments happen in our area, they do a lot of damage and leave a lot of damage to the, to the water, the land, and also the animals. It throws everything off balance. The, uh, we saw this IPCA as a big, as a great tool. You know, it can give authority to the Ininuak as uh, stewards of the land. It's time to take the lead in managing and protecting our lands. And IPCA is a wonderful tool that, that can do this. We, uh, I, I attended the first meeting in 2018 on the IPCA and then the First Nations attended another one on, in 2019. But we got this project underway in August of 2020 where we hired uh, Councillor Constant as a community lead, uh, project lead and then myself as the community lead and then we have Robin Constant as a project support, technical support. And then we work with uh, Hilderman, Thomas, Frank and Cram as advisors. So, um, so far like this, we've had a slow start, but you know, we're going forward slowly, but, uh, and, the, and the biggest challenge of course was the COVID pandemic. You know, as soon as we set up something to do Something then something comes along and then we have to change our plans, but we don't stop. We go ahead. We push ahead. And uh, we do that by having um, engagement with the community. We've informed our community of York Landing about the project by, you know, using brochures, posters. We've delivered uh, brochures to all the households in the community. We have gone on the radio a few times explaining the project both in English and Cree. So uh, it's just a matter of keeping our members updated. Um, we, have, uh, we have meetings, group meetings with the other four First Nations every four to six weeks, you know, updating each other and just, just sharing and talking about where we would like to go, what we would like to see, what do we want to do? How can we protect our land? And why do we want to protect it? You know, all these things come into consideration. So right now we're in a process of hiring community coordinators in the different communities and getting their working groups together who will be our, uh, our guides and uh, um, giving us all the information that we need. Um, we have our elders who have all the traditional knowledge, we will be uh, working with them. Um, these community coordinators will be working in their communities, gathering all this information from their, from their members. We also have initiated a York Factory First Nation school pilot project. I'll, I'll, I would like Robin to talk a little bit more on about that. When we were asked to get uh, workers together, we were given maybe pick three people, whether they're resource elder, but I wanted to, I put the number up to four because I wanted a youth involved in there with this project. They're very, it's very, very important that our youth are involved. They get left out of a lot of things and uh, they will be the ones that will be carrying on this project. You know, we're not going to be around forever. They will be the ones. And it's time that we start teaching them how to live off the land, how beautiful our land is and why we should protect it. Also, um, we're looking towards April the 7th as a target date for our blessing ceremony. In our, in our culture, any time we do or start any project, we always have a blessing ceremony. 
for the project so that it'll turn out good, you know, so that uh, everything works out. So at that date, the date of April 7th is what we chose for, for our visioning exercise. We will have the blessing ceremony as well as a visioning exercise from all the four First Nations. Uh, from all the five First Nations, I guess I should say. And then we had all also asked our principal, Morgan Serger, here in New York Landing to work with the youth in a school to see what kind of vision they they have for the for the for the land. How do they want to see it protected? What is their what is their vision for it? So we have a lot of challenges. We know we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and but like I said, it's time that the First Nations, the indigenous people took over and you know took over for the protection of the land. And the IPCA is an excellent, excellent tool for this. Um, right now, what I see is my commitment to this project. That's what keeps me going. And hearing the other four First Nations saying that, that, that they are willing to work towards uh, protecting the land also. And, uh, and of course, with the spirits of our ancestors, that's what makes us strong by working together. Um, <clears throat> hopefully with this project, you know, a lot of the young people are youth, don't know where they're from. They don't know their identity. They don't know where their ancestors are from. So this is what they have to be taught. They have to know where they're from because without an identity, you are lost, you know, and a lot of things happened along the way to our people that that took away a lot of this identity of theirs, whether it was their, their Cree names at first, everyone had a Cree name and then that was taken away. And then with the, uh, with the European contact, things changed, residential school, our relocation, you know, that, 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 that there's a lot of impacts on our people because of uh, negative impacts because of these so it's time to, to uh, get our youth together here and get them involved in these IPCAs. And uh, it's starting in the different communities. And, you know, it's, it's starting to work and it's good because they, they, they need to learn this. Um, we have, uh, we have um, excellent funders to help us with this project. And I just want to mention if, uh, some of them. And uh, we receive funding through the Canadian Nature Fund, uh, administered by Environment and Climate Change Canada, and also the Metcalf Foundation, uh, the International Boreal Conservation Campaign, and the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. These are all the funders that, that we have. And also right now what we're doing is reaching out to other, other uh, First Nations that have started their IPCAs, whether they have been working at it for a few years or, or just starting like us. And, you know, it's really good to, to reach out to them because we find out a lot of things, a lot of challenges that they've gone through and, uh, and what we will be going through as we, as we move along. <clears throat> So we're looking forward to that. The, uh, the uh, surprise I, I got was that everybody was so willing to work together towards this project. And that's, and that's a big, big, uh, that's, a, that's a, I think that's a big uh, success there when you, uh, when you get people that want to work together. So um, maybe with that, I can, Pass it over to Robin and ask him to talk a bit about his work. Thank you, Elder Flora. And Robin, would be now be a good time to share the uh, the map that you had shared with us? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And you can let me know. Um, I can leave it up for your while you're talking, or I can take it down in a in a minute. What's your preference? Let's leave it on for half a minute or so. Sounds great. Um, so 
Give me a second here. Well, um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Robin Constant, and I uh, come from the community of York Factory First Nation. Currently, I am living in Winnipeg with my fiance and her two children. But um, my role in the Kutaskinan project is that of project support. Um, my job is to help our YFFN community coordinator, Flora, with uh, day to day aspects such as um, handling all electronic communications to the First Nation. We have a project email address. It's uh, kitaskinan at gmail.com. We also uh, communicate through our Facebook page, Kitaskinan Gawi Kanawe Nitigatik. And uh, currently I'm designing the project website. It will be uh, kitaskinan.ca. Uh, that should be ready to launch in the next couple of weeks. Um, also, um, I prepare a lot of the documentation for the project, such as um, the project overview for First Nations document that was sent to each of the communities about three months ago. Um, I also design a lot of the marketing materials like uh, brochures and posters for our own community. So I do a little bit of web design and graphic design. Um, I'm also in the process of, of uh, compiling research uh, of our past community studies and reports, um, basically issues on land use planning and mapping, uh, trying to find all of our traditional knowledge, harvesting and traditional laws that may be out there with um, through our relocation history studies and uh, going through all of our elder interviews. Um, and also I'm just currently uh, doing some research and studying other IPC, IP series in Canada. But uh, yeah, um, it has been really challenging getting to this point because, um, you know, COVID-19 has been slowing down the project considerably. Eh? Um, all of our communities have been in lockdown mode since the fall. And uh, one of them actually even had to call in the Canadian military for assistance. Um, so that's really severely limited our project and our engagement with um, the other communities. Um, just trying to contain the virus and uh, there's other issues with winter road travel and monitoring, you know, people coming in and out of their communities. So that's been one sticking point there. Um, but in uh, but it's been good. Um, lockdown has been good on another level here. Um, since COVID-19 began, um, we've been able to uh, focus on youth engagement through the local school. Our school is called uh, George Saunders Memorial School. Um, Flora felt that uh, youth engagement would be very important in this project because uh, like she said earlier, the youth are going to be the future stewards of our traditional territories. And uh, they're also gonna be stewards of this proposed IPCA that we're trying to establish in the next couple of years here. Um, so she wanted to find a way to include and integrate our youth into this project. Therefore, we decided to initiate the New York Factory First Nations School pilot project to help engage and inform the youth on our IC IPCA project uh, through their already established land-based learning program. This is with uh, the assistance of uh, the principal. His name is Morgan Serger. And there's a knowledgeable teaching staff. Um, Personally, I was surprised that they had um, a land-based teaching system in the school already so, um, because we never had that growing up when I was young. Um, so that was very cool to see and hear about when uh, we met with them in January, two months ago. Um, also earlier in uh, December of 2020, our project team came up with an outline of school topics that we, that we would like to see being taught in the school to uh, highlight a lot of the stuff uh, that's happening with the Kataskinan project. Um, these topics include things like um, being able to teach our own la lands and history, uh, like the history of York Landing, uh, the history of our relocation, where we got to where we are today. There's a big uh, relocation history in our community. Um, we were forced to relocate from the, the Hudson Bay coastline in 1957. So there's um, 
a lot of knowledge that can be passed to the youth regarding that. Um, and also we want to continue the pre-alignment um, teachings. We want to teach the youth about our traditional culture and knowledge, like um, harvesting activities like hunting, fishing, and trapping. Um, also, we want to teach them about um, traditional and Western laws, including our treaties. And someone mentioned earlier um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP. Um, yeah, and we want to bring science and integration of uh, traditional knowledge and culture to the school. Um, we want to highlight environmental issues. And we want to bring uh, health, wellness, and spirituality to the school, like, um, like having ceremonies in the school, showing them medicine, sacred items, um, being able to go onto the land and uh, pick medicines and identify all kinds of trees and plants and flowers and all those kind of things, right? Um, so yeah, we want to bring these kind of things to the school, but um, to our surprise, a lot of this has already been done in the school. So um, so our, the, the school has been very willing and able to help us. It makes our jobs really easy. So, um, so uh, the basic plan was to um, have the wife offend teachers and staff teach each of those topics that I mentioned in uh, two week intervals. Um, the teachers would come up with the basic material, but then they would submit to us every two weeks. Uh, our project team here, Flora, myself and uh, HTOC would uh, collect this document and uh, create what we, what we, what we want to call a, a legacy document. Um, so we want to be completed that by the end of June. Um, this legacy document would uh, serve as a teaching template to guide the other four First Nations so that they can engage their own youth in their own schools. Um, and this would, and all this activity would take place in the next two years, right until the project is completed, I guess. Um, the community coordinators um, in each community, as Flora, as Flora mentioned, they will be responsible for um, engaging the youth in the in the schools and in their own communities. Um, so of course, it's not a requirement for the other communities to follow our pilot project, but um, we just felt it was one way that we could engage the youth in our community. And um, every community is free to engage their youth in their own way. So um, I guess that pretty much sums up our youth engagement activities. Um, Further engagement activities with the community in a whole is uh, dependent on how fast our communities are able to get vaccinated. Um, so with that, I guess, uh, thank you. Thank you for listening and uh, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elder, Elder Flora and Robin uh, for sharing um, some of the things uh, that stood after me are yeah, the, the struggle with COVID, absolutely. I think it's shared by all. Interesting to, to learn about how you've been informing the community. Um, that would be something that would, if you have materials, that would be so great to see how, how you speak about an IPCA to people who, you know, like it takes time to understand that terminology and it's not necessarily a, you know, uh, youth friendly term um, either. So, and, and youth is such an, are such an important um, uh, piece of, of the IPCA and the future of, of protecting the land. And um, so, yeah, there, there are questions about allies coming up in, in the chat and then the sort of the, the establishment process. Um, there was a question in French, which I will uh, translate to the team in the background. Um, so we, uh, we have uh, about 45 minutes left altogether on this webinar. We have another presentation um, coming up from um, the Arquivillite IPCA in Inuit territory in Nunavik, Northern Quebec. Um, so I, I wanna make equal space for uh, Shaomek Inukpuk and Jenny Knopp um, to speak about that initiative. And um, rather than rushing our panelists who have been so generous in sharing their time with us today, um, if our time is limited in the Q&A, which I anticipate it to be, um, we will do our utmost to find other ways to 
respond to your questions, be it by providing you with uh, everyone who's registered with a link to where you can find answers to those questions, maybe making another opportunity to come together just to have a discussion. Um, so please continue to share your questions in the chat to everyone. Our team will organize them and we'll, we'll find a solution to, to make space for, for discussion. So without further ado, over to uh, Shaumik and Jenny to please talk to us about your IPCA, Mark Vilit. Wow, wow. So many First of all, I want to thank our creator for giving me an opportunity to be here on this earth with you people. Uh, here in our community, we have Aquilid Indigenous uh, Protected and Conserved Area. Uh, it's uh, 155 kilometers northwest of Inukrat. They are the islands. Uh, Aquilid in our language means the place with bowhead whales. Uh, they're offshore and they're, they're not too far, even though they're 155 kilometers. And the majority of our population in this community is Inuit. And they had been here for at least 4,000 years, according to our geology findings. And we have hunted seals in the winter time, but sometimes people hunting up there uh, got drifted away by the ice movement and ended up in those islands, uh, Aquilid Islands. So all along within these 4,000 years, uh, there had been some times where people, uh, the Inuit has in, inhabited those islands. And we have an evidence of our geology sites. Um, also, my father had his own knowledge about those islands because he had traveled uh, to, the, to those islands with foot to foot boat. Uh, it was accessible, those islands were accessible for him. So his knowledge was transferred to me orally and I have kept them until there's a need, uh, need to use them. Uh, his knowledge over those islands is there's nothing out there but polar bears. Don't bother going hunting in those islands. Uh, it's just polar bear. Uh, this mean this message was those islands are polar bear habitats, and to make sure that they're actually polar bear habitats, uh, we had to check them visually if they actually are, and they were. We we flew over them, and the polar bears are still down there. So the oral knowledge that has been transferred to me was true. So there's a real need to protect those islands. Uh, how we came about in having the need to protect those islands is uh, there was a meeting concerned about, concerned about polar bears uh, population and they were talking about the need to establish the total allowable take and when this happened, if this were to happen, uh, our people will be exposed to danger of those polar bears if we limit ourselves in hunting them. Polar bears and people don't mix. So if we have to leave them out there, they are the threat to our people. 
and this caused a great concern to me as a town manager for this municipality. I'm concerned about the safety of our people. So I was thinking that these islands need to be protected. The first thing that came up to my mind was at least a sanctuary or a park. I didn't know the definition of these, but they were there, uh, meaning that it's a protected area. That's what we needed at that time. And as we go along, uh, IPCA came up, came up. Well, the need to protect was in my, in our mind, the uh, IPC came up and it was really good uh, just by hearing it, uh, indigenous. When it says indigenous, it should be in our favor this time. Uh, that's, that's what makes it good, the title itself. It's in the early stages. It has yet to be developed. And that was a, a really good avenue for us to take if we are going to protect those polar bears. Uh, we're still in this process, but it, it wasn't that easy to get up here uh, to be this far. The complex, the complexity of the application form where we had to apply for funding under Canada's Nature Fund through Environment and Climate Change Canada. We had to partner with Ocean, Oceans North uh, just to have the application form be acceptable to the funders. It's a long process and we would have gone this far if we did not partner with them. So teamwork is relevant to make the project success. Uh, I say this because I, we wouldn't have done it alone. We, we need to protect, but there are other issues that comes along with the protection. Our simple desire to protect the polar bear habitat is not a simple process. Uh, we end up, up having to deal with uh, uh, different stakeholders, for example, Nunavik Marine Region, uh, Hunting Fishing Trapping Association, Government of Nunavut, Federal Government, Makivik, all these organizations who say that they have a jurisdiction on those islands. We have to navigate ourselves uh, with with all these organizations involved. It's it wasn't a sim simple process. Uh, <laughs> believe believe me, it's not a simple process. We still have a, a long way to go, and we expect the outcome of IPCA to be more in our favor. To protect those islands will require quite a bit of funding uh, to get uh, acceptable data. We have our traditional knowledge, but since they're oral, uh, we still have to collect them in a paper, paper format uh, in a way that they can be read. We still have to do that. We know them uh, by heart, but we still have to put them in paper. And also uh, we have, we still have to collect uh, scientific data normally used by the federal government. And these scientific data to be collected are not that easy as well. We have to go to these islands and to get the scientific data to prove what we're ac ac actually working on. Uh, that's 
that's also another component. There are different components that comes along with a protection desire. So I didn't expect too much uh, out of it, but it's a whole lot of work uh, to do to get the kind of the protection status we want in those islands. Um, difficult. I may have missed some relevant uh, uh, points and I'll give it to Jenny if, if she can assist me with all these uh, organizations we had to deal with. <laughs> uh, Jenny? Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Knopp from Oceans North. Uh, we've been really honored to be a part of the Arcfleet IPCA establishment project since the very first step as team members and helping to write the application to the Target One Challenge Fund. And we were a successful recipient. So thank you to federal government for that support. Um, I think Shamik made a really good presentation. I'm not exactly sure what I can add, but I can add a few points. Uh, maybe I'll just say for those who aren't familiar with Nunavik, that Arkfilit, the Ottawa Islands, are in the northeastern part of Hudson Bay. If you're trying to find them on a map. Um, there's about 24 islands, 24,000 hectares, also consideration of the marine environment to be included in the islands um, by the steering committee to maintain ecosystem integrity. Um, Shamik's comment on all of the different interests is a very good one. So all of the different interested parties is a very good one because there are a lot of players when it comes to polar bears. Um, there's a federal government and provincial governments who recognize different um, populations that have certain boundaries, but I've heard Shamik talk about the fact that the polar bears don't necessarily respect those boundaries all the time, and Ottawa Islands is in the middle of one of the of two boundaries, actually, and so um, it, it is really interesting to work with some of the federal and provincial scientists on that. Um, I think one of the important points I want to highlight that Shamik mentioned is that the, the, the process of creating an IPCA still has a colonial element to it. There's still the science piece, there's still the documentation of traditional knowledge from oral to written. Um, there's still, you know, having to partner with people that maybe you wouldn't normally to work on a project to obtain funding. And so um, it's just something for everyone to think about when moving forward and considering IPCAs. And if this is uh, some of the hurdles that we can overcome and truly make it indigenous led. Um, so just want to highlight some of those things that Shamik already said. But Shamik, was there something specific that you wanted me to add? Um, did you want me to talk about some of the science work that we're doing? I want to suggest people might want to hear about the harvest of polar bears as well and how they're also important to um, Nivimute. So maybe you want to chat about that. Oh, you're on mute. Shamik, do you see um, the mute button on your screen? It's a red, looks like a red kind of microphone. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, the last point I want to make is I'm really happy that our uh, counterparts in, in Manitoba are doing their part in trying to protect, the, protect their area. Uh, please try to protect your area because whenever the water goes to Hudson Bay, uh, the current movement is counterclockwise and we are at the receiving end. So please be careful on what you're putting into the water. It most of the time eventually ends up in my place. Um, and the uh, econ economic uh, ec economic value of what we're doing is uh, really beneficial for our ecological system in Hudson Bay. Uh, to protect the polar bear, it means we'll have to have the polar bear all the time. 
they help us out in maintaining the critical balance of other species. Uh, for example, uh, if there are too many seals, uh, there wouldn't be not enough fish. And if there are too few polar bears, there would be so many seals. So the balance has, uh, is very important to the uh, limited reproductive capacity of our Hudson Bay is important. Uh, so the economic of our well-being will be reflected when we manage to protect these polar bears. Although we hunt them, we also need them to maintain the good balance of our ecosystem. Uh, those are the main points, and thank you for allowing to allowing us to make our presentation. And we will share with what we have. I didn't mention the composition of our uh, steering committee members, which who are also important. But we will share these information to the panelists. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure to listen to you both and uh, and to learn about this particular initiative. And um, yeah, every every IPCA, every nation may have a different reason for establishing an IPCA in their area. And um, I'm going to ask our team, our background team here, to spotlight all of our panelists um, who have. And if you enter, uh, your yeah, view, yeah, speak your view. yeah, um, yeah, um. I'm trying to protect the polar bears, mm -hmm. but I still need to protect myself as an Eskimo. We mm -hmm. are also threatened species. Mm -hmm. uh, be, being an, an Eskimo is a threatened species. Mm -hmm. And I haven't even put me myself as a threatened species yet. I have still have a long way to go. I'm working on a small portion of what needs to be protected on our part. <laughs> Thank you. You make a very good point. Yes. Thank you. Um, welcome. Welcome back, all of our panelists. Thank you for everything that you've shared. I'm sure people um, are feeling very grateful for your, your generosity. And I want to start with uh, our, our discussion with um, with a question that I think everybody can answer in a different way, which is, uh, and, and I'll just, some context is that, you know, the, the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, the Isak Ulam Foundation, um, were, the, the primary focus is to support nations in establishing Indigenous protected and conserved areas for the reasons that they want to do so. Um, and, and everybody comes across, you know, the, the this designation in a, in a different way. Um, for those who for those who are joining today as you know representatives of their communities um, or as uh, indigenous peoples who want to come bring back information to their communities and 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 share kind of de um, demystify a little bit and also remove some of the hesitancy that people feel and oh this is an intimidating thing and you all speak so eloquently so even though um, it, you may be in the beginning stages of your IPCAs, um, you're, you're still <laughs> experts in your own right because you know your territories. What was the moment, um, sort of the tipping point for you where you were like, yes, Indigenous protected and conserved area, that's what we need. And what is your advice to nations and people um, who are having, who are at that kind of moment of, should we, should we not? What's the, what's the value? Um, and I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna circle back to, um, to Justin and I don't see Verna, but Roseanne is there to speak from uh, the Akisibi perspective, sort of what was that moment? And I'll go back in, in the order that we began. So Justin and Roseanne, if you could unmute yourselves and if you have anything to share on that. Uh, thanks, Monica, and thanks everyone. Um, I can say uh, with Wolf Lake First Nation, uh, the turning point was all the pressure that the forest industry was putting on the landscape. And the Magna Sibi was kind of the first successful large-scale 
uh, conservation project that was undertaken. And it kind of led the way to these other interests, including on the water, which would be the uh, Fitzpatrick Island Act. Because traditionally the Algonquins had such an important role as guardians over the, all the waterways and from that particular land base at Alamed Island. They, they controlled it quite vigorously historically. And this is sort of a cultural historical repatriation. And um, also geologically, it's, it's of great interest because it's one of Canada's largest underwater cave systems um, in this particular area of the Ottawa River with Fitzpatrick Island having one of the lar largest sections of that cave system. And the Nature Conservancy had been trying to acquire that particular island for a number of years now to put together all the pieces of the cave system. But it was the owner of the island that they really took initiative in wanting to sell the island to the Algonquin people. So it's, it's a conservation project, but it's also part of this greater repatriation piece that's very important all across the country. Thank you. Justin, anything to add to that? Yeah, I can add just a few things. Uh, again, as the Algonquin Nation, you know, we're here in the province of Quebec, you know, we are on unseed Algonquin territory, so we've never signed treaties, we've never given away our land, but, you know, uh, <clears throat> on a daily basis, we're always having to fight to, to make that claim that, again, you no, know, we must be, be consulted uh, on any matters. And, you know, having a, an IPCA uh, implemented on our territories, even though it wouldn't encompass our whole Algonquin territory, <clears throat> it, it would go a long way in, again, uh, stating that claim. You know, as I think currently there's about 12 major projects either about to be implemented or going through environmental assessments and whatnot. So, you know, having an IPCA, I think, would go a long way in allowing us to really, again, state claim that, you know, these are our lands and we are the ongoing and original stewards of these lands. And I think even more important is you know, allowing us to build our own capacity. You know, when we're going through environmental assessments or harmonization and consultations, we're always having to hire outside consultants and experts to do a lot of the studies and plannings for us. But by having our ACCB Institute and our own IPCA, you know, we would also try and use this institute as a way to train our, our people today and tomorrow on how to do a lot of this work on our own behalf. So again, <clears throat> uh, keeping capacity funds and whatnot in community uh, and not necessarily having to go outside. So there's just some, some little points I, I wanted to add there. Miigwech. Miigwech, thank you. Um, Matt, uh, would you uh, weigh in on your perspective? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, you know, like I said before in ours and I think uh, pretty much all of it, communities you know that's all, always been a really important area for for communities that the, the areas that they're proposing uh, but for us you know it, it's always been but there was opportunities that came around uh, kind of started out uh, uh, becoming more of a, a, a you know not formal thing but more of a I guess documented thing I suppose uh, there's the North American caribou workshops uh, that was a couple years ago two or three Two or three years ago, uh, we we did our first presentation there. Um, there was you know increasing urgency to uh, you know for the provinces to and territories to do something about the species at risk act, specifically woodland caribou. Um, you know there were Section 11 agreements uh, struck that to uh, you know require um, indigenous participation. Um, you know, here in Alberta, there's the, reg the regional land use planning process, which is a legislated uh, process that that is uh, ongoing and in, in our area currently. Um, you know, there's transboundary opportunities, just given where we are, uh, Northwest Alberta, Northeast BC, uh, NWT. Um, I have to, I can't say enough about the Environment Canada and the Nature Fund. Uh, that was a significant, absolutely significant driver for 
uh, for our program at least, and many of the elements that we had put in, including a Indigenous Guardian uh, Tier 1 program, we built a, an app that our members can go out into the field and use their own phones and uh, collect uh, data, community uh, uh, community uh, uh, described data. So we, we built that there. Um, Aboriginal Fund for Species at Risk, Quick Start Program, there's others. Um, you know, locally we had Alberta EcoTrust um, involved in uh, supporting some of our work. Um, industry, we have local forest company, we were able to negotiate a, a 10 kilometer buffer around our reserves uh, in the detailed forest management plan. They're called community management zones. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, Mackenzie uh, Water, uh, uh, the, the bilateral water agreements and, and the water agreements in the Mackenzie River Basin uh, that, that we're part of. There, there's just a whole lot of things going on, not to mention that, you know, Ducks Unlimited uh, North American Waterfowl Management Plan, like we're working with them on, on that stuff. There's, you know, it's just, it's just, uh, there's more things that I probably uh, could mention, but you know, it, it's kind of like the, uh, you know, you, you get to the point eventually where, where it, just doing this is, it would be unreasonable to not do it. You know, you just build up, you just build it up where, where somebody's saying, hey, that's not something we want to do. You know, that it, it kind of sounds silly. So we're getting to that point. I think we're, we're, uh, we're, we're there. Uh, we just need a way to, to, to agree on how it could work. Um, you know, there's a, a bit of uh, discussion around, you know, what, what are the, uh, you know, what's, what's the geometry of IPCA? Uh, does it have to be an area? Can it be trails? Can it be cabins? Can it be a series? Do you, by implementing a heritage uh, trail network with cabins, do you kind of establish uh, de facto uh, area? Right. So there's a lot of, uh, in, you know, there's there's those type of discussions. And I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see uh, what we can arrive at with the province and others, um, you know, as the public engagement for our sub regional planning process uh, uh, begins shortly. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we'll move over to Elder Flora and uh... Robin, good if you're still there. Um, and yeah, as you weigh in, thinking about advice for nations who are um, sort of at that, you know, decision making point, do we or do we not? Is IP IPCA or no IPCA? What's the value? Um, some of the questions are also around, um, you know, private land and how that's impeded or or not the 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 initiative. And um, I can weigh in on, on that after, but I'll just put it out there in case those who are going to speak uh, want to speak to that. So Elder Flora, Robin, over to you. Oh, sorry, Flora, you're muted. Let's see. Yeah. Find that red button. There we go. It says it all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when you asked what was the turning point for me, I was invited to a water ceremony on the kiosk project that's happening on the Nelson River. And it was a mistake. We were in the bus and we were following the vehicle to take us to the tent where the ceremony was being held. But instead he followed a different vehicle which went across the channel to where the dam was being built. And I looked out the window and I saw the rapids and that they were already building in the turbine. And I saw the rapids and right away I thought of my late father. He talked about traveling up and down that Nelson from York factory in Gila many, many times. And that's the first time I ever saw those rapids and, and uh, I knew I would never see them again. <coughs> so that for me was, oh, it was very, so I started thinking a lot about the environment. I, we've always been, like with my husband and I in Churchill, we've always hunted, lived off the land, you know, as much as we could. But then that got me thinking about the environment and all the damage that's being done to it. Not, it's not only the uh, hydro developments, there are other industries too. But then I think our biggest, biggest challenge is going to be the global warming that's happening right now. Um, so when I 
saw this this uh, job posting for this IPCA. I was already retired. I said, I, want, I can do this. You know, I was thinking to myself, I can do this. But I wonder if I'll get it, you know. So I decided to apply for it, and I, and I did get the job. So there's my commitment there that I'm that I'm committed to this, and and uh, I'm going. We're going to try and make it work by working together. Uh, that was the biggest turning point for me. Uh, but like I said, the, not only the global warming is going to be a big challenge, but as we move along, like the, we're got our traditional laws. Our people lived by their laws a long, long time ago way before European contact. And we want to bring those back. And I guess the thing I would like to see is no interference at all in these indigenous protected and conserved areas. No interference at all from that province and from the federal government. That is what I would like to see. Let us run it the way we want to run it. I was there. Thank you. Robin, any thoughts? Well, um, well, the turning point for me was uh, actually uh, last year. Um, I only first I only first heard about IPCAs in the, I guess last January. <laughs> I'm a person with a computer science background, so like I'm not really heavily at the community level there. Um, but as a First Nations person, I am very heavily involved with our First Nations ceremonies and the culture here in Southern Manitoba. So, um, you know, when I saw the ad for this, to be part of this project here, um, you know, I jumped on the opportunity because uh, it aligns perfectly with my values as, a, in, as an Indigenous Cree person. And um, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to this project. and. Um, I'm hoping this COVID thing will go away sooner, sooner than as soon as possible, <laughs> so we can get on with the work. Yeah. I'm very excited about this. Thank you. Thank you, um, Shalmik. Any thoughts for you from you? Uh, advice to others who are uh, uh, about to embark on potentially a similar journey? Uh, yes. Uh, my my turning point where we all began was the time when our hunters harvested 72 polar bears in one year. Uh, that caused a great big concern for government of Nunavut, uh, Hunting Fishing Trapping Association for Nunavut. Uh, it caused um, it caused a big concern for everybody else. And we were actually accused of not being able to manage our species. And they even said that we have no plans, we have no management. Uh, that was the kind of the message I received, which really hit me. Uh, like in my presentation, I was saying that we have been here for 4,000 years. And today, to, to our good management system, we still have polar bears, we still have species. Because our uh, law, traditional law, is simple but effective. It says, don't kill anything unless you're going to eat them. That's the law we have to abide by. We're not supposed to kill anything if we're not going to eat them. So with this law, we still have the species that we rely on. And that the knowledge we have that are inside are not interpreted because they cannot be seen. But it, it wasn't easy for me to be accused of something that we were all proud all along. Uh, after all these years, uh, we were proud of our system, uh, but somebody else didn't. 
So even if you're not liked by anybody, uh, just to try, just try to do what you can do to keep yourself going, to protect yourself. Uh, uh, no matter what negative comments you receive, just keep on going. Even if you counter the obstacles as you go along, there are always other alternatives that can be taken. So don't give up uh, while you are in the quest for conservation. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny, is there anything that you would add? I don't think that anything else more strong or more important can be said than that. So thank you, but I'll leave that the last comment with Shamik. Thank you. Um, there's also a participant named Jimmy Oli Katalik, and I apologize for pronunciation, um, who was asking if, uh, if he could share something um, orally. Um, sure. There you are. I can see you at the top. Yes, please go ahead. Yep. I'm very uh, honored to be a uh, part, uh, part of this uh, panel for uh, discussion. Uh, I feel very uh, for all the uh, IPCA. Yeah, um, when um, when I started, when, uh, when uh, we started, uh, I had to I had to say, uh, you know, we're we're hunters and we're, we have to use the scientific um, documents like we're hunters and we're gatherers. So that means we're not farmers, and our uh, livestock is. Uh, need to be protected from um, you know, industry. So um, also up here in the north, um, this is where the um, the um, um, sorry oxygen is 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 uh, is re, um, re, re restored in the north, where it goes back to our own, our own earth. So we have to keep the north very, very clean. It's not only for us, it's uh, for the world. Um, those are the, some of the things uh, we'd we, we like to, um, yeah, being, being, um, being in it, um, and you know, living off the land, it, it's true. You know, we we only we've always been. We only take what we need. We don't take more than what we need. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, so it's very enlightening. I'm 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 just my like my turning point is going. And I like to thank everybody that helped. Uh, WWF, that connection, all those people that help us throughout this uh, uh, application. Uh, I just want to say that I just want to share that with me. Thank you, thank you so much for for sharing that. Um, I think many people um, are here feeling the same, and um, we're acknowledge we want to acknowledge all of the the questions and and comments and thanks that are coming in in the chat to everyone and and in personal messages. And um, there's great appreciation, and um, we're bound by the clock in, in some ways. And so I, I just want to, everybody who's joined here today to to see a little bit what's been going on in the background. I'm going to just show you quickly, and, and it's a great tool for this type of um, event. It's called Padlet. And so as your questions were coming in, I'll just give you a quick snapshot. We've been organizing them sort of thematically. Um, so you can see, you know, how we've been honoring <laughs> what you've been sharing as well. Um, and we can put a link to what that tool is. It's free in the chat. Um, but so we are going to go through those questions. We're not going to be able to answer them um, today as we're a few minutes from the top of the next hour. 
whatever that hour is, wherever you're joining from. Um, so we do need to wrap up the the webinar. Um, and I'm sad to, to let anybody go because I know you have so much more that you can share and so much wisdom, um, but potentially part B is, is in order um, if you're willing. And so um, I, I wanna thank everybody, panelists especially, and all participants um, for joining today. Uh, for, on behalf of the Isak Olam Foundation, the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership, and also acknowledge the support that we got to host this webinar uh, from Environment and Climate Change Canada. Um, there are so many, uh, so many answers and so many different perspectives to the questions that have been asked um, by those who have joined today. And, um, and the dialogues will continue on uh, through the virtual campfire series. And um, I will be communicating with panelists to see if they'd be willing to share contact info and I'll leave it to them to decide whether that's um, appropriate or not. Uh, again, if you joined late uh, due to technical issues on our end or what have you, um, this webinar has been recorded and will be available as early as next week, I understand. Um, on the YouTube channel of the CRP, which um, we'll get to you as well. So um, I'd like to invite Elder Flora Beardy to um, close the webinar in a good way. Thank you. Um, mute button again here, let's find that. There you go. I'll do my blessing in three and then in English. Blessings for me, the mouth. Again, I just got back just a minute ago. I just can't then I'm Puma. Give a nice comment now, no magagi, my watch it here. Let's take a one, the best in them. Kitaski <laughs> So Great Spirit, it's time to meet with you again. We have finished our meeting and we thank you for bringing us all together. Thank you to all who made it possible. Our land is very important to us. It gives us life, it heals. <clears throat> we need to preserve it for future generation. generations. We ask you to bless everyone to the north direction, to the east direction, to the south direction, and to the west. So we never know, I'm just a man too, so we never know. I go say. I go say. Oh. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>